So, but I'd like to spend a few minutes now on human interaction with the Atlantic and the crossing of the Atlantic. Well, we all know the Atlantic separates the old world from the new world, and uh, here various attempts of traveling across have been made. Usually Christopher Columbus is uh, accredited with making the first passage, but most likely he was not the first human to cross the Atlantic. And uh, he was probably the most famous one for a long time, but there were several attempts before him. I should point out Tor Heyerdahl, and maybe you have the opportunity to see the museum in Oslo. He believed that there was the opportunity, for example, for Egyptian cultures to travel across the Atlantic in papyrus boats. And he tried to simulate this. He built the Ra One, and Ra after the Egyptian sun god, and he made this from papyrus, and um, he sailed across the Atlantic. The Ra One never made it. It actually sank. So he believed that he can do better, and he built the Ra 2, and um, he managed to actually bring the Ra 2 into Barbados in 1970, and he showed with this experimental type of archaeology that in theory, people from the old world could have crossed the Atlantic already thousands of years ago. There was never any real evidence to show that any materials from the old world had been brought over to the new world. Um, there is no archaeological evidence. So, while in theory it could have been possible, there is not a lot of evidence that this really happened. Now, you may have heard about St. Brendan's journey, and St. Brendan was an Irish monk, and um, he traveled with a cowskin boat, it's not believed that he reached the Americas, but uh, he, leech, uh, he reached what is known as the Blessed or Fortunate Isles. And it's not quite clear what islands they were, and uh, some people say it could have been further down south in the Atlantic, other people say it was Iceland or some other place like that. But uh, St. Brendan, he traveled in the 500 AD uh, area, and he reached these islands where he describes rivers of gold fire and great crystal pillars. Now, how much of this is just imagination and how much is reality, we don't know. But he also describes these as blessed islands. I don't think Iceland would have qualified for that at the time. So I think more likely he reached the Azores or the Canary Islands. And uh, that would have both been kind of, you know, on the eastern side of the Atlantic, maybe in the center of the Atlantic. Some people speculated it could have been the Faroe Islands, but there was no volcanic eruptions in the Faroe Islands for many millions of years, so I don't think they are really good candidates either. Then, of course, there was the Vikings, and the Vikings were very experimental. Eric the Red, he was living on Iceland, but he didn't get on with other folks so, so well, so he was made an outcast. He had to leave for three years. He was exiled for three years. And where to go? Well, he didn't want to go back to Norway. So he settled further west and he formed, he built the first settlement on Greenland. And he returns to Iceland later on to attract more settlers. And he was a smart, cunning chap. And of course, he didn't call it the land with the big glacier. He called it Greenland. So making it sound very attractive. And indeed, there was settlements then later on, but they didn't last, they didn't survive. And his son, Leif Eriksson, he went even further towards the west, and he is accredited with discovering Vinland, which was probably present-day Newfoundland. And there is some archaeological evidence. There has been some Viking artifacts found on Newfoundland, so there's a good chance this story is actually real. Then, of course, Christopher Columbus, and um, he was Italian, but he was in Spanish service, and he sailed under the Spanish banner of Queen Isabella, and um, he wanted to discover Asia and India because he wanted to create new trade routes. I read up quite a bit on him, and he had some very intriguing encounters on the way. Apparently, he even had an affair with the governess of El Hierro, one of the small Canary Islands, and Queen Isabella got so unhappy about this that there's a letter saying, 
Mr. Columbus, can you now sail off, please? And eventually he did sail off after claiming he had to repair his ships multiple times. But uh, he went out there. And at the time, he was, he was believed to be a great sailor. And later on, uh, scholars later on, they questioned that a little bit. They uh, speculated that maybe he wasn't quite as great a sailor as he made himself sound in his logbooks. So here's the evidence for that. The upper map here is how Columbus viewed the world, with the Americas being a shaded blue, light blue area there, and the orange colors being the world as Columbus imagined it. So sailing off from Iberia and northern Africa towards the west would have ultimately brought him to an area in Asia. That's what he believed. And to his last breath, he believed he actually reached India. He never understood that he actually discovered the Americas. He did several journeys, and um, the fourth voyage is marked in yellow here in the lower right-hand map. And um, he traveled backwards and forwards multiple times. And note a pattern. Usually his travel westwards was further south than its travel back to Europe. So it was like a flat-lying circle that he did multiple times. He believed that it was his skill that allowed him to do that, but of course the reality is there is an ocean current. And I think with a bit of luck he just hit this ocean current that brought him towards the Americas and back. So here is the North Equatorial and the Gulf Stream Ocean Current, and this is exactly how Columbus sailed. He went down to the Canary Islands, and from there he went westwards, and then he came back a little bit further north, hitting Iberia again. And this is why some people say maybe he wasn't the most skilled sailor, maybe he just was a very, very lucky sailor. So, a few words now about more modern times. And this is the uh, transatlantic telegraph cable. I thought I'll say a word about that. This was going back to the 1860s and the 1850s. In fact, that's where the first attempts were made. A transatlantic telegraph cable was laid, but the first one was actually very poor and it had to be replaced within less than 10 years. But it was a huge effort and large cable ships were bringing these cables across the Atlantic. And uh, initially the cables broke quite frequently and strangely enough they often broke over the mid-Atlantic ridge because nobody had any idea that there was volcanoes down there. Well, they learned and uh, eventually better routes were found and in 1865 um, uh, a really good strong cable was laid allowing speedy communication between the old and the new world. Then of course, eventually, we developed other means of transport, air travel. And I should of course mention Mr. Lindbergh, Captain Lindbergh, he flew across the Atlantic and he flew to Paris and this was of course a great feat and it took him 33 and a half hours. Well, these days if I fly for 33 hours I end up in New Zealand so there's quite a difference there but for him this was of course a, a great adventure and uh, well he's still remembered for this outstanding achievement. A little while later, this uh, person, Amelia Earhart, she set out to do a similar thing. And of course, she was the first woman to achieve um, transatlantic flight. And uh, she was actually a lot faster, but she also chose a shorter route. She was quite nifty about this. And she did it in 21 hours. And um, here is a few images of her. And um, she traveled from Newfoundland to Wales. And she received the... Uh, U.S. Distinguished Flying Cross for that, which I show here. Tragically, she went missing um, on her well all around the world flight in 1937. And to this day, we actually don't know where her plane went down. So this is an old U.S. stamp, and maybe some of you remember it. Um, this, uh, of course, shows her and the airplane in the background. Now, 
one of those more tragic chapters, and this is the Battle of the Atlantic, and uh, this was, of course, in the Second World War, 1939 to 45, and large convoys with supplies were coming over from uh, the US towards the British Isles in particular, and uh, this was strategically extremely important for both sides in the war, and uh, there I'll show a little map here. The issue was... Uh, Crossing the Atlantic was quite possible, but the Germans, of course, they had these U-boat packs, and air cover was a real issue. And here in the upper diagram, you see these circles, these blue circles. That's the reach of the airplanes, and the red dots are sunken uh, freight ships, and the dark little crosses are sunken U-boats. And you know exactly where most of the freight ships were sunk, and that is where there was no air cover while most of the U-boats were actually sunk close to port where airplanes could reach them. Very intriguing distribution of things, and this was actually why Iceland was so extremely important. And this is why Britain actually occupied Iceland at the time, so that they could extend the air cover over the Atlantic.